Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Thursday, April 11th, 2024. The FBI Director Christopher Wray tells Congress, I'd be hard-pressed to think of a time when so many threats to our public safety and national security were so elevated all at once. As he endorses a reauthorization of the FISA Section 702 Spying Authority, minus adding a warrant requirement. This comes a week before Section 702 expires. And as negotiations continue among House Republicans on a bill that can pass the House. House Democratic Leader Akeem Jeffries suggests that Speaker Mike Johnson's job may be safe if he brings a bill with aid for Ukraine to a vote. And a House Republican follows through on her threat to bring a motion to remove the Speaker because enough Democrats will vote against that motion. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida speaks to a joint meeting of Congress, telling members that after World War II, you believe that freedom is the oxygen of humanity. The world needs the United States to continue playing this pivotal role in the affairs of nations. Biden administration announces a rule to require thousands more firearms dealers to do background checks on buyers. This is to address the so-called gun show loophole. The FDA Commissioner Dr. Robert Califf testifies before Congress. House Oversight Committee approves a bill to add a citizenship requirement to the next census in 2030 and to reapportion seats in the U.S. House among the states based only on the population of U.S. citizens. And Pro Football Hall of Famer O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76. He was also famous for being acquitted of murder charges in the 1990s. We'll hear from author Jeffrey Tubin, interviewed on C-SPAN, about racial tensions in the aftermath of that trial that continue to this day. Story from TheHill.com, House leadership is eyeing a plan B to reauthorize the country's spying authority after a band of 19 GOP lawmakers blocked the legislation from advancing Wednesday. The plan under discussion would shorten the reauthorization of Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, from five down to two years and bring the controversial package back before the Rules Committee. A member and a source familiar with the situation told The Hill, leaders are looking to bring the legislation through the rules panel as a standalone bill, the sources said, untethering FISA from three other GOP bills opposed by Democrats. That detail could open the door to getting Democratic support for a rule vote to bring the bill to the floor, which would be a rare instance of the minority party voting in favor of a rule. That was from The Hill. Meanwhile, the FBI Director Christopher Wray told a House Appropriations Subcommittee that Section 702 is a necessary tool to confront the array of threats facing the United States. We continue to see the cartels push fentanyl and other dangerous drugs into every corner of the country, claiming countless American lives. We've seen a spate of ransomware and other cyber attacks impacting parts of our critical infrastructure and businesses, both large and small. Violent crime, violent crime, which reached alarming levels coming out of the pandemic, remains far too high and is impacting far too many communities. China continues its relentless effort to steal our intellectual property and most valuable information. And that is just scratching the surface. As I look back over my career in law enforcement, I would be hard pressed to think of a time where so many threats to our public safety and national security were so elevated all at once. But that is the case as I sit here today. And while we have always found ways at the FBI to innovate and make the most with what we have, this is by no means a time to let up or dial back. This is a time when we need your support the most. We need all the tools, all the people, and all the resources required to tackle these threats and to keep Americans safe. So to take each of those in turn, the tools, the people, and the resources. First, an absolutely indispensable tool that Congress can give us in our fight against foreign adversaries is the reauthorization of Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It is critical in securing our nation, and we are in crunch time with our 702 authority set to expire next week. So let me be clear, failure to reauthorize 702 or gutting it with some new kind of warrant requirement would be dangerous and put Americans' lives at risk. The FBI Director Christopher Wray, part of his opening statement at today's House Appropriations Subcommittee hearing. A USA Today article 
says the sticking point lies in Section 702, which allows U.S. authorities to surveil communications of foreigners without a warrant. Because those foreigners often can contact Americans, their information is also swept up in data collection. As a result, the FBI can conduct searches on American data collected through the law without a warrant. That was from USA Today. Back to the hearing, Congressman Andrew Clyde, Republican of Georgia, questioning FBI Director Christopher Wray about proposals to add a warrant. As you know, the government agencies typically need a warrant issued by a judge before they can access American citizens' phone calls, texts, internet searches, and emails. However, the government, in my opinion, has been able to query Section 702 acquired communications as an end run around the Fourth Amendment. My colleague, Andy Biggs, um, representative from Arizona, has an amendment to the current FISA reauthorization that would require the government to obtain a warrant or to obtain a FISA court order prior to conducting a U.S. citizen query of information already collected through the 702 FISA program. You know, you previously stated in a Senate hearing in December that it would be unworkable to require the government to get a warrant before collecting Americans' private communications. Yet former NSA lawyer George Croner recently estimated the warrant requirement would force the FBI to get about three warrants a day. Now, Director Ray, you've got more than 30,000 employees that work for the FBI. Are you seriously saying that three warrants a day is too much of a burden for the FBI to protect our Fourth Amendment rights? That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is, number one, no court has found that the Fourth Amendment requires us to use a warrant to look at information, to query information that's already in our 702 holdings lawfully, and the only courts to look at it have gone the other way. That's the one. Number two, the problem with the warrant requirement goes beyond any kind of burden or delay that comes with it. The the big part of the problem is that it's often only by running the query that we get to see the information that tells us whether or not we would meet a warrant requirement in the first place. All right, I've got one more question for you before my time runs out. Investigation. All right. The FBI Director Christopher Wray questioned by Congressman Andrew Clyde, Republican from Georgia, at a House Appropriations Subcommittee hearing. The House meets Friday at 8 a.m. Eastern and is expected to try again to bring up another version of a Section 702 reauthorization. You can follow live gavel-to-gavel coverage of the House on C-SPAN television at cspan.org and on the C-SPAN Now mobile app. The House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat from New York, urged House Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican from Louisiana, to put the National Security Supplemental Spending Bill on the House floor for a vote, saying it's the only path forward and allow the House to work its will. The bill would provide aid to Ukraine, Israel, Palestinians, and Taiwan, At least one House Republican has threatened to bring a motion to vacate the Speaker's chair if Speaker Johnson allows any vote on aid to Ukraine. Today, Leader Jeffries predicted, quote, a reasonable number of Democrats would vote no on that motion to vacate and keep Speaker Johnson in his job. The only way forward at this late hour is for House Republicans to put the bipartisan, comprehensive national security bill on the House floor for an up or down vote so we can provide support for our Democratic allies in Ukraine, Israel, the Indo-Pacific, including Japan, as well as make sure we can surge humanitarian assistance to Palestinian civilians who are in harm's way in Gaza through no fault of their own and other civilians in theaters of war throughout the United States of America. That is the only path forward. Enough with the delays, the obstruction, the gamesmanship, the obfuscation. Enough. The world is on fire. American leadership is required. The entire post-World War II rules-based society on the global stage is at risk if because of inaction in the do-nothing Republican House, we fail to provide Ukraine with the support that it needs to push back against Russian aggression. There's only one path forward. Now, I've made the observation, not a declaration, the observation that if the speaker were to do the right thing 
and allow the House to work its will with an up or down vote on the national security bill, then I believe that there are a reasonable number of Democrats who would not want to see the Speaker fall as a result of doing the right thing. Observation, not a declaration, because we have to have a conversation. I didn't necessarily mean to rhyme there. <laughs> but a conversation amongst ourselves as House Democrats uh, before making such a solemn decision. The House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat from New York, at his weekly news conference. Some updates on the war between Israel and Hamas from the Washington Post. Israel announced it's beginning construction on a new crossing from Israel to bring aid into northern Gaza amid growing international pressure to address the humanitarian crisis there. Samantha Power, administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development, told lawmakers that conditions in the enclave are as dire as any I have seen in my career. And Hamas says it needs more time and safety to get a full accounting of the Israeli hostages held in Gaza. That was from the Washington Post. At the White House briefing, Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre was asked about the administration's response to the war. The um, USAID administrator, Samantha Power, has said that she accepts as credible reports that famine is already underway in northern Gaza. Uh, does the president and the White House share that assessment? And if so, you know, you were talking about the progress is good, but more needs to be done. Ex- what more can exactly. be done? Exactly. The progress is good. More needs to be done. I talked about the commitment that Israel had, uh, the prime minister gave to the to the president just last week. And we talked. About, I talked about the port, and I talked about the new uh, border crossings in northern Gaza. We need to see that open up, that move forward. But we've seen some progress, right? The opening uh, of uh, more routes and also so more trucks, as I just laid out, we've seen more than a thousand trucks in the last three days. Look specifically to Samantha Powers and her comments. Our understanding is that the latest reporting from the integrated uh, food security phase classification indicates that the famine is imminent in Gaza, and that's why we're trying to do everything that we can to uptick, obviously, the humanitarian aid. We know how dire the situation is in Gaza, so we are certainly deeply concerned about these reports, and so we've been working around the clock around the clock to get more of that aid uh, into Gaza. And so we're going to continue uh, to do this. We're going to continue to push Israel uh, to increase the flow uh, that is getting into Gaza. And like I said, we have laid out their commitments. There are two other ways that we want to see uh, their commitment continue, which is that port that I just mentioned uh, at the top and just moments ago. Uh, and uh, and so also those um, the routes, uh, the routes in, in northern Gaza. So there's more work to be done, but again, a thousand trucks over the last three days is an improvement. It's good promise. We need to see more. The White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre taking reporters' questions in the White House briefing room. A story from Reuters: Iran has signaled to Washington that it will respond to Israel's attack on its Syrian embassy in a way that aims to avoid major escalation, and it will not act hastily. As Tehran presses demands, including a Gaza truce, Iranian sources said. Iran's message to Washington was conveyed by Iranian foreign minister during a visit on Sunday to the Gulf Arab state of Oman, which has often acted as an intermediary between Tehran and Washington, those sources said, reporting by Reuters. The U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, was in Washington today at the State Department news conference, talking about the anniversary of the civil war in Sudan story from Deutsche Welle reads that fighting in Sudan between the army and paramilitaries has been ongoing for almost one year. Two generals are fighting for control over Africa's third largest country and its vast resources. The bloody conflict has killed thousands and sparked a humanitarian disaster. According to the United Nations, around 25 million people, more than half the population, need aid, and nearly 18 million face acute food insecurity. That was from an article from Deutsche Welle. Here is the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, at the State Department briefing in Washington. April 11th should be a historic occasion as we mark the five-year anniversary of the revolution that toppled the Omar al-Bashir's regime, his 30-year reign. Five years ago, you could practically taste the spirit of freedom, peace, and democracy in the air as women and young people took to the streets demanding change. And yet, that baby I met in September is not growing up 
in a free, peaceful, democratic Sudan. Instead, she's one of millions whose lives have been upended and forever altered by this war. Today, nearly 25 million Sudanese people live in dire need of humanitarian assistance and protection. Three quarters of them face acute food insecurity. Nearly 8 million have had to flee their homes in what has become the world's largest internal displacement crisis. We've seen reports of gang rape, mass murder at the hands of the Rapid Support Forces militia, of girls sold into sexual slavery, boys been ma being made into child soldiers, of urban areas destroyed by area weapons and entire villages burned to the ground. And yet, as communities barrel toward famine, as cholera and measles spread, as violence continues to claim countless lives, the world has largely remained silent. And that must change, and it has to change now. The international community must give more, it must do more, and it has to care more. The U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, at today's State Department briefing in Washington. She was joined by the U.S. Special Envoy to Sudan, Tom Perriello, who has said the U.S. will be pushing for $100 million more in aid to Sudan. From the Associated Press, the Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida addressed U.S. lawmakers at the Capitol on Thursday, urging them to consider the importance of global commitments at a time of tension in the Asia-Pacific and deep skepticism in Congress about U.S. involvement abroad. On Capitol Hill, his audience included many Republicans who have pushed for the U.S. to take a less active role in global affairs as they follow the America First ethos of Donald Trump, the presumptive Republican presidential nominee. That was from Associated Press. Here is the Japanese Prime Minister at the joint meeting of Congress. The U.S. shaped the international order in the post-war world through economic, uh, diplomatic, uh, military, and technological power. It championed freedom and democracy. It engage, encouraged the stability and prosperity of nations, including Japan. And when necessary, it made noble sacrifices to fulfill its commitment to a better world. The United States policy was based on the premise that humanity does not uh, want to live oppressed by an authoritarian state uh, where you were tracked and surveilled and denied from expressing what is in your heart and on your mind. You believe that freedom is the oxygen of humanity. The world needs the United States to continue playing this pivotal role in the affairs of nations. And yet, as we meet here today, I detect and an the current of self-doubt among some Americans about what your role in the world should be. This self-doubt is arising at the time when our world, world is at history's turning point. The post-Cold War era is already behind us and we are now at inflection point that will define the next stage of human history. The international order that the U.S. worked for generations to build is facing new challenges, challenges from those with values and principles very different from ours. The Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida in a speech to a joint meeting of Congress. He has peppered his comments the past couple of days during his official visit to Washington 
with some pop culture references. In his speech to Congress today, he reminisced about his early childhood years living in New York City, going to Mets and Yankees baseball games and watching the Flintstones cartoon on TV. At Wednesday night's state dinner at the White House, he invoked another 1960s TV show in his toast with President Biden. Let me conclude with a line from Star Trek, uh, which you all know. To boldly go where no one has gone before. (laughs) By the way, Joji Takei, who played uh, Hikaru Suru, the helmsman of the USS Enterprise also has roots in Hiroshima. (laughs) Mr. President, Dr. Biden, uh, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, I would like to propose a toast to our voyage to the frontier of the Japan-U.S. relationship with this world. Boldly go. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida offering the toast at the White House state dinner in his honor Wednesday night. He is from Hiroshima, Japan. Story from Voice of America. U.S. President Joe Biden is hosting the Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida and the Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. at the White House Thursday aiming to send China a clear message to halt its aggressive behavior against its neighbors in the South China Sea. The trilateral summit comes amid increased tension between Manila and Beijing. In recent weeks, Chinese Coast Guard ships have taken provocative actions to block resupply missions for Philippine soldiers stationed on the second Thomas Shoal, who guard Manila's sovereignty claims over the Spratly Islands. The so-called gray zone tactics of intimidation fall dangerously close to triggering a mutual defense treaty between Washington and Manila and will be a focus in Thursday's summit. That was the preview from Voice of America. The three leaders did make some opening remarks at the trilateral summit. Here is President Biden. Mr. Prime Minister, today uh, we mark a historic moment the first ever leaders summit between the United States, Japan, and the Philippines. And it's truly an honor to have you both here as we begin this new era of partnership. As you've heard me say before, a great deal of history in our world will be written in the Indo-Pacific over the coming years. And the three, um, as the three allies, three steadfast partners, and three proud democracies, representing a half a billion people. And today, we commit to writing that story in the future together. To building the Indo-Pacific that is free, open, prosperous, and secure for all. This afternoon, we'll discuss a few key areas where our nations are deepening ties. First, technology and clean energy for securing our semiconductor supply chain, from securing our semiconductor supply chain to expanding trusted telecommunications in the Philippines, to building clean energy workforce, to expanding our cooperation across the entire board. Second, we're deepening our maritime and security ties. This is something I know you've discussed with Vice President Harris during her travel to the Indo-Pacific. And I want to be clear, The United States, the United States defense commitments to Japan and to the Philippines are ironclad. They're ironclad. As I've said before, any attack on Philippine aircraft, vessels, or armed forces in the South China Sea would invoke our mutual defense treaty. Finally, I'm proud to announce we're launching an economic corridor in the Philippines as part of the G7's Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. This is the first corridor in the Indo-Pacific. It means more jobs for people across the entire region. It means more investment in sectors critical to our future, clean energy, ports, railroads, agriculture, and much more. 
I'm looking forward to discussing all this with all of you. President Joe Biden at the White House meeting with the Prime Minister of Japan and the President of the Philippines. A Chinese embassy spokesperson in the United States said in a statement to Voice of America about this trilateral summit, patching up small blocks, stirring up confrontation under the excuse of cooperation, upholding peace and order in name but flexing military muscle, and stoking chaos in nature do not meet the trend of, for peace and development and run counter to the regional country's shared aspiration for stability and development. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi there, I'm Jonathan from C-SPAN, along with my colleague, Ben. Since C-SPAN's founding 45 years ago, the media world has changed. Remember when there were just a few TV channels? Now we've got streaming, social media, apps, and more. Through all of this, C-SPAN has stayed true to its mission of giving you unfiltered access to government wherever you get your news. As we navigate this challenging media environment with fewer people subscribing to traditional cable packages, our funding has been impacted. That's why we're asking for your help to keep going strong for another 45 years. Please donate today at cspan.org slash donate. Your contribution, large or small, helps ensure at least another 45 years of witnessing democracy in action. Keep C-SPAN thriving in today's ever-changing media landscape. Visit cspan.org slash donate to make your gift today. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast wherever you find your podcasts and also on the C-SPAN Now mobile app, which is free. The Biden administration, writes CBS News, announced Thursday final plans to expand requirements to perform background checks for those who buy firearms at gun shows or online, aiming to effectively close what gun control advocates have long referred to as the gun show loophole. The new federal rules will not create new law, but will expand the definition of licensed firearms dealers. This move will also sharpen existing enforcement measures to ensure that the background screenings, which have not traditionally been necessary at certain gun sale locations, are carried out in more circumstances. That was from CBS News. Both President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris posted 30-second videos. Folks, I've spent hours with families who've lost loved ones to gun violence. They all have the same message. Do something. Well, today, my administration is taking action to make sure fewer guns are sold without background checks. This is going to keep guns out of the hands of domestic abusers and felons. And my administration is going to continue to do everything we possibly can to save lives. Congress needs to finish the job and pass universal background check legislation now. Hey everybody, so as the head of the White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention, I'm very excited to tell you that as of today, we are closing the gun show loophole. Basically, we are requiring that anybody who sells guns as a dealer has to do background checks. And what we know is this is gonna save lives. So it's an important step forward. We got more to do. We need to pass an assault weapons ban. We need red flag laws and universal background checks. But good news to report today. Take care. Videos from President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris posted today. More from the CBS News article, the Justice Department estimates there are around 23,000 unlicensed firearm dealers who will now be required to complete background checks when selling guns, although senior administration officials said that predictions about the unlicensed gun market are imprecise. The expanded background requirements emerged from Congress's passage of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act in 2022 and will go into effect 30 days after the rule is published in the Federal Registry this week. That was reporting by CBS News. Congressman James Comer, Republican from Kentucky, posting on X today. Every Democrat in the Oversight Committee yesterday voted against a bill seeking to add a citizenship question to the U.S. Census. The census asking whether you are an American citizen or not shouldn't be controversial. Congressman Comer chairs that committee. The bill is titled the Equal Representation Act and would require only U.S. citizens be included in the population totals for the apportionment of members of Congress to each state after each census. The next census is 2030. Here's some of the debate in the committee on Wednesday before the vote. Clay Higgins, Republican from Louisiana, in support. 
The census is to count every person. The, the problem is the, the level of illegal persons that now live within the, the continental borders of the United States has reached such a point that it thwarts the intended service of our representative republic in the House of Representatives, in the People's House. Pr prior to the Biden administration, it was, was, was well considered and well estimated that there were about 30 million illegals living within the United States. Took 240 years to get there. By the time President Biden leaves office, an additional, say, 15 million will have entered our country. You're talking about 45 million people. America, pay attention to this. 45 million illegals, that's 60 congressional seats. And where do you think those illegals are being drawn to live? In sanctuary states and sanctuary cities, densities of population which have advertised and welcomed and brought, and brought these illegal citizens there. Why? Why do you think this has been one of the, the, the core tenets of agenda of the Democrat Party? is to thwart the very essence of our representative republic by stacking the deck during the, the census, whereby apportionment for congressional representation will be permanently shifted to sanctuary states and cities. Four, 45 million illegals at 60 seats, America, Congressman Clay Higgins, Republican from Louisiana, at Wednesday's Oversight and Accountability Committee markup of this bill requiring the citizenship question on the census and then having only U.S. citizen population to decide how many members of Congress that each state will get. Congressman Robert Garcia, Democrat from California, spoke against. We know that a complete and accurate count of the census is incredibly important for our function of government and, and to support every single person in this country. We're hearing um, all sorts of, in my opinion, just backwards arguments, um, arguments that are nearing talking about the great replacement theory and really, I think, undermining the value that immigrants and every person make in this country. And I just want to just um, make an important note. I, I served as mayor of my community for eight years before coming to Congress and having an accurate count of every single person that is in your community is critical to the services you provide all of those individuals. And we know that changing the census in this way would lead to massive undercounts in states like California, but in every state across the country. Census counts impact the healthcare and how, and how we are able to provide it. It impacts funding for public schools. And just recently it impacted how much support we got during the pandemic. A census count basically impacts federal dollars and how many dollars we get to take on federal emergencies, how we uh, respond to people that need health care during a pandemic. And so, so much of our public services are dependent on an accurate count from how kids learn, from how seniors access health care, from how many emergency trucks can come in and respond to a crisis, to how many shots and vaccines a community will get during a pandemic is all dependent on an accurate count from the census. And so this effort is nothing but a way to separate out people that need services and really will lead to, to not counting every single person in this country, which we know is also unconstitutional. And so I think it's really shameful that we have this effort. I think this moves our country backwards. It certainly, in my opinion, is a direct attack, especially on undocumented people in this country. And I think this is all because, unfortunately, of the rhetoric that Donald Trump has um, ha has really grown and, in and infected across across this country. Congressman Robert Garcia, Democrat from California, at Wednesday's Oversight and Accountability Committee markup of this bill. He and other Democrats on the committee arguing that the bill is unconstitutional, referring to the language in the Constitution's Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, that speaks of counting persons, not citizens, during the census. 
The FDA Commissioner, Dr. Robert Califf, testified today before the House Oversight and Accountability Committee, getting questions on a variety of topics, vaccines, drug shortages, food safety, marijuana rescheduling. The chair of the committee, James Comer, Republican from Kentucky, asked him about tobacco regulation. I think it's safe to say the current regulatory process at the at the CTP is not at all what Congress envisioned when it passed the Tobacco Control Act 15 years ago. From the Reagan Udall Foundation Report, U Commission, and recent court rulings, I, I have to conclude that those seeking to play by the rules don't even know what the rules are, uh, because FDA won't tell them, or FDA won't put information out, or, or they will put information out and then change it. So now, after 15 years, FDA has granted only 45 authorizations out of some 26 million applications and only five authorizations for modified risk tobacco product. And while FDA rejects applications based on science and data from manufacturers who have spent untold millions to comply with what they think the rules are, American store shelves are overflowing with products from China. And your agency does not seem to be doing anything about it. So, Commissioner, given what I just described, I have to wonder... Do you even want a functional regulatory process for these products, or is it the objective to target the U.S. tobacco industry, even if it means allowing a flood of Chinese products containing God knows what into this country? Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, you're from Kentucky. I am from, grew up in South Carolina, uh, lived in North Carolina, and I was a cardiologist at a major medical center. I saw many, many people die from the ravages of tobacco. So the basics here, first of all, um, the major cause of remediable death in the United States still today is tobacco-related illness. 460,000 people will die from tobacco-related illness this year. So we're very much intent on doing the very best job we can, starting with combustible tobacco. And the good news is, as I said in my opening statement, we have a decline in that. What was not even present when the initial law was passed that you referred to was the presence of vaping or e-cigarettes. No one anticipated there would be 26 million plus applications of vaping products. Uh, that is a bit overwhelming, but good news here, we're 99% done, including almost completely done now with the major manufacturers. But you're, and so um, the onus that Congress did give us is what's called a public health standard. When it comes to vaping products, it's a benefit of helping adults reduce use of combustible tobacco, the major killer, outweigh the risk of teenagers and children getting addicted to nicotine, which is a brutal, fierce addiction that's almost impossible to shake once you have it. And so far, only 31 uh, products, last I counted, have produced the evidence to meet that public health standard. All the others you referred to simply didn't produce the evidence. Now, if I could say a word about enforcement, I know that was the other issue. It bothers me as much as it does you to see what's on our shelves. And, but I do want you to know that we've really picked up our enforcement. Over uh, 600 warning letters to manufacturers, uh, hundreds of civil mo money penalties now, um, and we've also now begun to do um, injunctions to to stop, but every one of these cases is in an environment where every step we make ends up in court in complicated lawsuits that have to cause us to go back and take that into account. So it's a battle every day. We're engaged in it, and yes, we do want to regulate it. The closer we can get to zero combustible tobacco, the better. The role of vaping is still something we're working on. And we'll get back to that. My time's expired. We'll, we'll I'll have another round of questioning with that specific, because. Sure. These products on the shelves that, that are getting the bad headlines are Chinese products that aren't even regulated by the FDA. FDA is regulating the American companies, but the Chinese companies are the ones that are the bad actors. That, so we'll get, we'll, we'll get back to my time's expired. I it's Congressman James Comer, Republican from Kentucky, chair of the Oversight and Accountability Committee, questioning the FDA commissioner, Dr. Robert Califf, at today's hearing. You can find the video of the hearing in its entirety at our video library, cspan.org. Bloomberg Law reports the Senate approved a measure to block the National Labor Relations Board's joint employer rule, siding with business groups that argue it would be too costly. In another blow to the rule after the federal court recently struck it down. The Congressional Review Act resolution, which passed in a 50 to 48 vote Wednesday, now heads to President Joe Biden's desk for an expected veto. Senator Joe Manchin, Democrat of West Virginia, and independent senators Kirsten Sinema of Arizona and Angus King of Maine joined Republicans 
in rejecting the NLRB rule, which lowers the bar for finding that two companies must share obligations to negotiate with unions as well as joint liability for labor violations. That was from Bloomberg Law. Also, Senator Josh Hawley, Republican from Missouri, voted no. Senator Joe Manchin spoke on the Senate floor on Wednesday before the vote. Franchising is a pathway to entrepreneurship for Americans across the country, and it helps build generational growth by providing access to capital, training, managerial assistance, and a system of support which is so needed in small rural areas. The franchise model helps many Americans overcome the numerous barriers to owning their own business. For the first time, the dream of coming true of having your own business and controlling your destiny. One out of every three franchise owners say they wouldn't own a small business without the franchise business model that they buy into. The unique model is used by over 5,000 independent businesses in my state of West Virginia, providing over 45,000 jobs. This new rule has further confused the issue and put the franchise model at risk. Under this rule, businesses are liable for entities they do not control. I repeat, under this rule, businesses will be liable for entities that they do not control. And it makes no sense. Let me give you an example. If under this brand there are uniform standards for their products, or they would require hair nests to be worn, they would then be found as a joint employer. As simple as that. If that's part of the model you buy into, part of the franchise you bought, has certain requirements to deliver products safely and healthy. This is despite the fact that they have no responsibility, no responsibility or role in hiring, firing, or wage decisions for their employees of any way, shape, or form. Does that make any sense? It just doesn't. Senator Joe Manchin, Democrat from West Virginia on the Senate floor on Wednesday before the Senate vote to pass this resolution to block the National Labor Relations Board joint employer rule. The House has also passed the resolution, so it goes to the White House. President Biden is expected to veto it, and overriding a veto takes a two-thirds vote of the House and Senate, and the initial votes to pass it did not reach that level. On Wall Street today, the Dow down two, the Nasdaq up 271, S&P up 38. O.J. Simpson, writes ABC News, the former football great who was accused of and ultimately acquitted of the brutal 1994 slayings of his ex-wife and her friend, has died, according to his family. He was 76. Simpson's 1995 televised trial, dubbed the Trial of the Century, was an international sensation, with the private lives of the participants, including witnesses, attorneys, and the presiding judge, as much news as the trial itself, which sparked controversy and racial tensions from the time the jury was impaneled in November 1994 to the October 1995 reading of the verdict. That was from ABC News. In 2016, C-SPAN interviewed legal analyst Jeffrey Tubin about his book, The Run of His Life, The People, the O.J. Simpson. Jeffrey Tubin talks about being in the courtroom for the verdict. Even then, I knew that it was an amazing thing to be in the courtroom at that moment. I knew that this was like being in the Zapruder film. This was a piece of history that was unfolding. And I didn't even know at that red hot moment when the verdict was being announced about the racially polarized reactions that we would soon see, which sort of vaulted the story even more into the public consciousness. Which is my next quote from the book. You say, racism in law enforcement has persisted through many decades in American life and black citizens and thus black jurors have stored too many insults for too long. The police in general and the LAPD in particular reap what they sow. That's right. And, and you know, I, um, I wrote this book in the immediate aftermath of the O.J. Simpson case. And 20 years later, um, Brad Simpson and Nina Jacobson, producers, came to me and said, we want to make uh, a miniseries based on it for the FX network. And, the, the, and with Ryan Murphy, they made this magnificent series that was broadcast earlier this year. And, you know, it just shows how a great story is timely forever. Because the, the, the miniseries came out in the immediate aftermath of Ferguson and uh, Eric Garner's death in New York, and all these incidents that gave rise to the Black Lives Matter movement. And this story, especially the way I wrote it and the way it was portrayed in the FX series, 
was about race in America and about how jurors especially saw African American jurors saw the relationship between the African between the Los Angeles Police Department and African Americans and it turned out in my view that OJ Simpson deserved became the utterly undeserving beneficiary of that poisonous history Jeffrey Tubin author of The Run of His Life The People v OJ Simpson Interviewed on C-SPAN 2's Book TV in 2016, the family of O.J. Simpson says he has died at the age of 76. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter word for word and get the stories making headlines in Washington emailed to you every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night. 